Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the intestinal stem cells. Okay, so we're currently discussing the Wnt beta catenin pathway because we want to understand how this pathway is going to maintain these intestinal stem cells in the stem cell, st stem cell state. Okay, uh, so we have just discussed the off stage of the Wnt beta catenin pathway, which is when there is no Wnt present in the extracellular fluid. We've seen that normally there is this beta catenin destruction complex assembled. Um, which is going to phosphorylate beta-catenin proteins once they've been produced. And this phosphorylation allows another enzyme to bind to them, known as the beta-TRCP enzyme, which will then ubiquitinate these beta-catenin proteins, which will then be targeted for degradation by the proteasome. Okay, right. So, what we now want to see is the on state of the Wnt beta-catenin pathway. Okay, um, which is when there is going to be Wnt present in the extracellular fluid and it will be activating our frizzled receptor and our LRP5-6 receptor. So let's draw this here. So let's say once again this is the cell membrane. Okay, we've then got our frizzled receptor here which remember is a G protein coupled receptor. So here is the carboxylic acid terminus. Then we've got our large amino terminal domain here and then our amino terminus over here. Okay, right. Then we've got our Wnt molecule bound here, okay, to the amino terminal domain of the uh, frizzled receptor. So let's color these portions in. So let's have Wnt in purple. Let's have the amino terminal domain of the frizzled receptor in red here. Okay, so this is our frizzled receptor here, which I'll just abbreviate as FZ. Okay, and now we need our LRP 5 slash 6 protein here. So here's the carboxylic acid terminus. Here then is the fourth beta propeller domain here. This is the third beta propeller domain here. Okay, here is the second beta propeller domain here. And here is the first beta propeller domain. Okay, and then you have the amino terminus of the polypeptide right up there. Okay, and we've got our Wnt molecule binding to um, the um, P3, P4 Wnt binding site, which is that binding site, remember, that consists of the um, bottom portion of P3 and the top portion of P4 here. Okay, so this is the LDL receptor-related protein 5 or the LDL receptor-related protein 6. Right, okay, so... We're now in the on state. The cell has been exposed to the Wnt protein. Okay, so what's going to happen, firstly, is that a protein is now going to come and bind to the um, base of the frizzled receptor. Okay, and this protein is known as a disheveled protein. Okay, and it's often abbreviated as DSH, like so. So this is short for disheveled. Now that's the abbreviation I like for disheveled, but some people use the abbreviation DVL, okay? So be aware that you might see that uh, used, and it is used quite often, but I think disheveled um, more naturally abbreviates to DSH, and, you know, it's not just me, other people use DSH as well. Okay, so disheveled, it can be abbreviated to DVL or DSH, so again, uh, you, you pick. Right, uh, we will use DSH in this video. Okay, right. Now, uh, there is not just one disheveled protein. Again, it's an entire family of proteins. As far as we're concerned, uh, they all do the same thing, so we'll just abbreviate this as a disheveled protein. Okay, right. So, once the frizzled receptor has bound its wint, it now gets this protein disheveled bound to it. Okay, and now what's going to happen next is that disheveled is going to bind to components of the Wnt beta catenin destruction complex. Oh, sorry, not the Wnt beta catenin destruction complex, just the beta catenin destruction complex. So remember, the beta catenin destruction complex consisted of an axin protein, an APC protein, a glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta enzyme, and a casein kinase 1 alpha uh, enzyme. So basically, the basic idea of how we're going to turn the Wnt beta catenin pathway on is we're going to inactivate the beta catenin destruction complexes. And the way we're going to do this is by uh, 
binding components of the beta catenin destruction complex to the disheveled protein, which those components now will not be able to be part of a beta catenin destruction complex. So basically, disheveled is going to bind to axin proteins. Okay, so here's an axin protein, and this axin protein will still have bound to it a casein kinase 1 alpha enzyme and also a glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta enzyme. Okay, so in orange here, this is our axin protein, which is binding to disheveled now. Okay, so this is axin. And then we've got the two enzymes here. One of them is casein kinase 1 alpha, which remember binds to axin. Okay, and the other is glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta. Now, the adenomatous polyposis coli protein is not here, note. Okay, so it's just axin with the two enzymes, with glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta here in green, and uh, casein kinase 1 alpha, CK1 alpha here. Okay, right. So, that is firstly um, going to now reduce the number of beta catenin destruction complexes which are present in the cytoplasm. Okay, because we are now isolating components of the beta catenin destruction complex by binding them to the disheveled proteins, okay, which have been activated by binding to the frizzled receptor. Okay, so the beta catenin destruction complexes are going to go down in the cytoplasm. They're therefore no longer going to phosphorylate beta catenin proteins, which means that the beta catenin proteins won't be able to bind to the beta TRCP and therefore won't be ubiquitinated by beta TRCP and therefore won't be destroyed, so they survive basically. Now, not only that, we haven't finished yet, this is actually going to have a positive feedback loop and let me show you how. Okay, we are going to bind more components of the beta catenin destruction complex to this structure here. Okay, so what's going to happen basically is glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta here is now going to phosphorylate the LRP5 or the LRP6 proteins cytoplasmic tail. Okay, so because we brought GSK3 beta very close to the cytoplasmic tail of LRP5-6, it now phosphorylates uh, that residues within that tail. Okay, and now the phosphorylated cytoplasmic tail of LRP5-6 is capable of binding to more components of the uh, beta catenin destruction complex. Specifically, it's now capable of binding to axin. Okay, so here is axin, the scaffold protein, and the axin can bind to glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta. Okay, so we'll also have a glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta bound here. Okay, uh, so casein kinase 1 alpha doesn't seem to be being a part of that. Um, so the phosphorylated cytoplasmic tail of LRP5-6 seems capable of sequestering axin as well as glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta here. Okay, but those are certainly two components of the uh, beta catenin destruction complex sequestered. Okay, so now this is the overall function then of um, these activative receptors and co-receptors uh, for WIND. Uh, they are going to bind to and sequester components of the beta-catenin destruction complex so that the number of beta-catenin destruction complexes within the cytoplasm now goes down. So you don't phosphorylate beta-catenin and therefore you don't destroy beta-catenin. So what's going to now happen is beta-catenin proteins that are being produced all the time by the translational machinery of the cell are actually going to get to survive. So. Here we have beta-catenin proteins. So this is what is happening within these stem cells, these intestinal stem cells that remain within the stem cell niche. Their beta-catenin levels are going up within the cytoplasm of the cell, whereas it's not going up in those cells that uh, are pushed out of the stem cell niche uh, and up at the sides of the crypts of the bacum, and those are going to go on to um, terminally differentiate because their beta-catenin levels will drop as soon as they get pushed out of the stem cell niche. Okay, so 
we now want to discuss what high beta-catenin levels are going to do. Okay, right. So, beta-catenin is now going to go into the nucleus of the cell. Okay, so let's just draw a little picture here. Here is the cell. Here is the nucleus. Beta-catenin is going to go from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. So everything we've been talking about so far has been happening in the cytoplasm. Now we're transferring into the nucleus. Now, once again, it is better to step back now, okay? Because we have seen what happens in the wind beta catenin pathway when it's in the off state. Um, we've seen what happens in the cytoplasm. We now need to take a step back and look at what happens in the nucleus when it's in the off state. So once again, before talking about the beta catenin, um, wind beta catenin pathway in the on state, we need to firstly talk about the off state. So I want to now discuss what is happening within the nucleus of the cell when there is no beta catenin in the nucleus. Okay, and then we'll move on to what happens in the nucleus of the cell when there is beta catenin in the nucleus. Okay, right. So let's discuss what um, happens in the nucleus when beta catenin is low. Okay, so we've got no beta-catenin in the nucleus, let's say. We now need to discuss something called the TCF-LEF transcription factors. Okay, so this is a family of transcription factors. So in order to discuss this family of transcription factors, I firstly want to discuss with you what a transcription factor actually is to make sure we're all on the same page with regards to this. And then we'll specifically discuss this family of transcription factors, and I will tell you what TCF and LEF stands for in a moment. Okay, so firstly, what is a transcription factor? So, for now, uh, represent... Uh, sorry. For now, let these two parallel lines represent a double-stranded piece of DNA now. Okay, so it doesn't represent the inner and outer leaflet of the phospholipid binder anymore. It represents a double-stranded piece of DNA. Okay, now, let this region here, which I'm boxing, and I think I'll even colour it in in red here, let this represent a gene. Okay, now... Um, one of the strands of DNA within a gene is going to be known as the coding strand. Okay, so this portion in red, sorry, in pink here, will let this be the coding strand. And this is the strand that the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme, uh, often abbreviated to RNAP2, okay, for RNA, then P for polymerase, and then 2, uh, this is the strand which RNA polymerase 2 is going to work along and synthesize a piece of mRNA that's complementary to it. Okay, so we're going to produce mRNA that is complementary to the coding strand. Okay, right. Now, upstream of the uh, gene, uh, and this goes for all genes in a eukaryotic cell, okay, there is a region known as the promoter region. Okay, so this portion here, this represents the promoter region for this gene. Now, the promoter region is not actually involved in uh, being translated into uh, a sequence of amino acids. So it's not actually going to be code for a protein. Okay, but it is very, very important for controlling the expression level of the downstream gene. Okay, so the promoter region controls how much of the protein for this downstream gene you are actually going to produce. Now, the way that the promoter region controls uh, how um, m much protein you're actually going to produce for the downstream gene is that it controls how much the downstream gene is going to be transcribed. Okay, so the process of um, converting the gene into a piece of mRNA, uh, it, that's called transcription. Okay, uh, so the promoter region controls the rate of transcription of the gene. Okay, so it controls how much mRNA you produce for this gene. Okay, right. So why does that mean that the... Well, how does it do that, firstly? Well, basically, the promoter region controls this by 
because RNA polymerase 2 has to bind to the promoter region in order to then work its way along the gene and produce the piece of mRNA that's complementary to the gene. Okay, so if the promoter region promotes, uh, well, if the promoter region um, is very good at uh, getting RNA polymerase 2 to bind here, okay, and then work its way along the downstream gene, then RNA polymerase 2 will bind there all the time, and you'll get um, mRNA being produced for the downstream gene all the time. Whereas if the promoter region is very bad at recruiting RNA polymerase 2, then RNA polymerase 2 will hardly ever bind there, you'll get hardly any mRNA being produced, and therefore very low expression of the gene. Okay, so, what then is a transcription factor? Okay, well, a transcription factor is a molecule which combines to uh, a specific sequence of organic bases. Okay, so each transcription factor recognizes a specific sequence of organic bases, usually around 6 to 10 organic bases long. Okay, and uh, this transcription factor will bind to this sequence, okay, and this sequence of 6 to 10 organic bases known as the recognition sequence for that transcription factor, uh, this will be found in the promoter regions of a huge number of different genes. Okay, so transcription factors therefore bind to these recognition sequences in a whole plethora of different promoter regions. Okay, and what that transcription factor then does is it changes the um, ability of the promoter region to uh, recruit the RNA polymerase 2. Okay, so it changes the likelihood that the downstream gene is going to be transcribed, basically. And there are many different ways it can change the likelihood that the downstream gene is going to be transcribed. We will see some mechanisms uh, in this video. Okay, right. So transcription factors then bind to specific recognition sequences that are in many different promoter regions, and they change the likelihood that RNA polymerase 2 will be recruited to that promoter region. And, you know, sometimes they will increase the affinity or the likelihood that RNA polymerase 2 is going to bind there, and sometimes they will decrease the affinity that RNA polymerase 2 is going to bind there. If they increase the likelihood that RNA polymerase 2 will bind there, then RNA polymerase 2 will bind there more often, and you'll get an increase in the mRNA being produced for that downstream gene. If they decrease the likelihood that RNA polymerase 2 will bind there, then RNA polymerase 2 will bind there less often, you'll get less mRNA being produced, and therefore uh, less uh, expression of the downstream gene. So a transcription factor can either increase or decrease the affinity um, of the promoter region for binding to RNA polymerase 2, uh, and thereby uh, increase or decrease the expression of the downstream gene. Okay, and it's not necessary that at all promoter regions the transcription factor will be either um, enhancing or repressing. Okay, at some promoter regions it might enhance um, the transcription of the downstream gene, at others it might repress the transcription of the downstream gene. Okay, right, so we'll call it there for this video. Uh, in the next video, what we'll discuss is uh, what the TCF, LEF family of transcription factors are, and then their involvement in the Wnt beta catenin pathway.